All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Rudy Molina. I'm your Vice Provost for Student Academic Success and Enrollment Management here at JMU, and I'm going to be your moderator for tonight. We have a few questions lined up, uh, but first let me introduce um, our Provost and Senior Vice President, Dr. Heather Coltman. And from Student Affairs, we have our Vice President, Dr. Tim Miller. We're going to answer some questions that you put forth, and then also we're going to have uh, an opportunity for you to ask questions um, throughout the throughout the event. Uh, we're going to start with some of the questions that you submitted when you first registered, and then we're going to move into the Q and A. You can actually submit your questions by posting in either the Facebook or the YouTube stream. Um, if we don't get your questions tonight, just know that we're going to be able to follow up with you via email, and we'll have links to um, to the URL and pages where you can find more information. So. Let me go ahead and kick us off for tonight. Um, why don't we start with a big question? What is the rationale behind JMU's virtual start of classes and delayed return to campus? Tim, can you start us off with that? Sure, thanks Rudy. So first, it's really about uh, watching what we learned from the fall. Um, we wanna do everything we can to maximize the possibility that once you return, that you'll be able to stay through the end of the semester. And when we, you know, when we started the semester in the fall, we learned from that. We also saw that after Thanksgiving, when we had a lot of people that did interact, we did see some community spread. And we had heard and read and also talked to our colleagues from across the Commonwealth and across the country that everyone was worried about what would happen after the winter holidays and New Year's and that spread. So we wanted to give ourselves a little bit more time um, and also give our students a longer time to be at home. So it was really about being able to watch, see how things were spreading, see how the numbers were going. Uh, but also to give ourselves a little bit more time. We were seeing, you know, about 10 to 20 days after events like a Thanksgiving, after New Year's, things like that, we were still seeing some spread. So this gave us time to look at that. Um, also, though, let's note that as of January 19th, all services will be open and fully functional for student use. This includes UREC, dining, and resource centers. Anyone that has followed me over time knows that I'll be there every Wednesday at 6.30 for Hit with Nora. So, you know, UREC will be there for you. Uh, all the dining will be open, um, that, that we'll have open initially, uh, counseling, everything. So please know that everything will be functional and ready because we also know a lot of students will be returning to live off campus. Uh, but we wanted to be safe and give ourselves a chance to watch things for a little bit longer by delaying for two weeks. Heather? I'm so sorry about that, folks. Um, we know that moving to fully online in the fall was, was tough, and not only because virtual learning is harder or lesser than face-to-face, -face, but because the change was so unexpected and we were not fully prepared. But we are addressing that by uh, making the decision now and letting you know ahead of time in, um, in time to plan for the virtual classes in the beginning of the semester. Um, and we also set a firm date for moving to our regular schedule. We've, as, as Dr. Miller said, we've got to be cognizant of the latest health and safety regulations, but we are planning no changes to the mode of delivery after February 1st. So whatever your class shows as in my Madison um, right now, as of the 1st of February, that is how you're going to meet. Um, and I'll just add one other quick reminder, the libraries will be open as well and, and fully staffed for your support needs if you uh, want to spend some time in the library once we open up. Great, uh, thanks for kicking us off. Um, on a related note, we received this question. Many of the universities in the DMV area are staying online during the spring 2021 semester, with some already decided to stay online during the summer semester as well, um, in order to protect the health and, and uh, the, the students and employees. With the COVID-19 infection rate at the highest, uh, at its highest around the nation, why is GMU requiring students to attend in-person classroom lectures in this uh, spring term? Uh, Heather, can we start with you? Yeah, sure. Our goal is to have um, as, as many options available to our students. We want students to have the experience that they choose and that they prefer. So we are offering a mix of online and in-person classes. Um, and actually for this upcoming spring, we have an almost equal number of options, virtual and face-to-face. -face. So students can make the choice that's right for them. Um, and based on our success for the time that we were on campus in the fall, we're pretty confident that the health and safety measures we put in place are appropriate. And I just got to give a shout out to our faculty and staff and, of course, all of you, the students, 
for the way that you handle the face-to-face -face class meetings and, and other um, opportunities to get together. There has been no transmission of the virus in the classroom. So we know that that's because you all were responsible and you reduced the spread of COVID on campus. So you didn't come to class sick, you wore your mask, you washed your hands. So these kinds of actions and precautions that everyone has taken has really paid off for us. Great, thank you. Um, let's stay on that same track, actually. We have a question from Olivia. Um, will there be an accommodation to remain online if we were uncomfortable, if we are uncomfortable with returning to in-person classes? So any student who has any medical condition or health condition um, and, and that causes them to be concerned about attending in-person classes, definitely reach out to the Office of Disability Services and they will help you discuss the options and make some alternative arrangements. And I would just add to that too, that, um, and Heather, correct me if I'm wrong, there are a lot of classes that are, there are some sections in person and some that are online. So students also will have the, could have the opportunity of looking to see if there's another option for some classes, not all, but students could just be flexible and look and see if there's a different time, maybe a different faculty member to take some classes as well, correct? That's correct. All right, wonderful. And um, as we talk about classes, we've gotten several questions from students already about the adding and dropping of classes. Nick asks, will the add drop deadline be moved until after students are able to experience courses in their advertised delivery mode? Uh, Provost Coltman, can you uh, address that one? Sure. So our ad drop deadline is January 29th. This will give almost two full weeks for students to explore their classes and get to know their instructors. Um, we know that the in-person courses won't have met face-to-face -face at that time, um, but the students will be moving into the mode of delivery that they signed up for originally. We know that it's really problematic to extend that date. Um, this is uh, a real issue for financial aid compliance. When people drop after that date, um, we can't include them in the final count for some federal purposes. So we are uh, very concerned about compliance. Um, and then also we had a whole group of folks across campus discussing this issue, looking at attendance and, and dates. And they concluded that, you know, having additional uh, extensions on the straight is really difficult. It's really problematic administratively. And it also, again, like I said, most importantly, affects those on financial aid. So that's why we're uh, keeping that ad drop deadline to um, January 29th. Okay. Um, let's um, move into, or at least continue on with academic policies. Students have asked, what is the JMU policy for credit, no credit for spring 21? So there is a policy link that we're gonna put into the chat that you can look at we are not changing the current policy and you can pull it up there as soon as it's been posted. There are several reasons that the academic affairs leadership have decided to keep the current policy. And, and let me just give you a few of those highlights. When students have um, few or no letter grades over several semesters, this can do considerable harm to their overall student transcript um, and can impact students um, down the road in very negative ways. So, uh, that's really an important consideration. Also, we spoke to a number of our academic deans and many faculty in some of the very specific fields. And for students who want to go on to graduate or professional schools, we know that many of those, most of them, don't recognize credit or no credit grades. So that is also an implication for students who plan to pursue additional study. Um, and I think also many faculty noticed that a lot of students lost motivation after they had the option to take um, class, uh, classes as credit or no credit. So we we're concerned about that and we've decided that we're gonna keep our policy intact. All right, great. Um, one last academic policy question before we move on to testing. Will the course or university withdrawal deadlines uh, be extended? So we don't anticipate that we will extend those deadlines. If we do make an extension, it's because the university as a whole has had to adjust in some significant way. And you know you know that we're in a fluid situation and that might occur, but we don't anticipate that at this time. All right, great. Okay, so uh, switching gears a bit, um, we've already gotten a lot of questions about testing, different kinds of testing, which ones are required, who has to get them. Uh, we know that testing is an important way to monitor and limit um, the spread of the virus. We received a few questions about entry testing. So let's start there. 
Um, will JMU accept negative COVID test results if a student brings with them to their scheduled test time? And if so, what time frame should they get tested before returning? Dr. Miller, can you start with us? Sure. Thanks, Rudy. And when this was in the message that I sent, it's also out on FAQ. So you can always go there and look, go to the Stop the Spread website and find all this information. So I'll answer it, but just so people know, you can always go there and look. Um, there's different testing programs and a lot of differences between them. So I want to talk about both our two different testing programs for students living on campus. So entry testing the 29th through 30th at the Convocation Center. Early arrivals that are approved by ORL, they'll receive separate information. So if you work that out, you'll hear from them. We're using the ticketing system to have students sign up. So helpful and thankful to athletics for that. That's already a system that works well for these types of things. And we encourage students to use our testing site, but however, if they prefer, they can test before they come. So this is the more nitty gritty that might be easier to read on the site, but I'll, I'll go through it. Students will need to complete and have results within the allotted timeframes. For a rapid antigen, A-N-T-I-G-E-N, it's 24 hours before they arrive. And a PCR, it's a 48 hour prior to their appointment time coming to campus. The two tests are different, so that's why there's different timelines. Students are in interested in testing before they arrive must schedule an appointment. Um, so before you show up, we need to set up an appointment because we want this to be a smooth process. Uh, and then you're, you'll stay in the building. So you'll come in for your appointment time, you'll get checked in, you'll get your test, then you'll wait for your test results. So you'll actually stay in the building while you do that. So it's important that you have that in mind, that you will actually remain there. And then, you know, depending on the result of your test, you'll either, you know, go differently. So that's one testing program. Second, surveillance testing. Starting February 9th, we'll test 300 students each week, which is about 5% of our on-campus population. Uh, students need to respond to that. This is an expectation. It is in the Stop the Spread Agreement, so you're agreeing to that. Uh, and again, the Stop the Spread page in the FAQs is a really important place for you to go to learn more about both of these testing processes and your participation in them. All right, great. Um, we have um, a parent from an out-of-state student asked a, a question. Um, in the email sent out about COVID testing upon check-in, it states that the students who test positive should return home. Will quarantine dorm rooms be available if an out-of-state student tests positive upon checking in? I'll take it. Uh, so any student that tests positive should return home. Uh, it's important that we don't overload the beds that we have available right away. Um, so the worst thing we could have is, you know, having students come and then we, you know, test that number of beds immediately. Uh, there will be minor exceptions, uh, a few of those, mostly students who fly or if they do have travel like that, if they've traveled you know, a very long distance, uh, we would work with them and, and provide them an isolation bed. But it's important that again, students are doing what we're asking. They should be quarantining for eight days before they come so they don't have a chance of testing positive. Um, and we'll actually work with them and a healthcare professional and a member from Resident Cycle will work with them on scene to determine the best next steps for them. But again, if students are quarantining eight days before they come, then getting their tests, they should be fine, being safe the whole time. Uh, but we will, we will, we're not gonna put anyone out in the cold, so to speak, in that moment, we'll take care of folks. But it's important that everyone understands that this is a personal responsibility. You need to come negative, being safe, and, um, and if you, there is no way to go home, we'll take care of it. But the vast majority will be sent home. Great, Dr. Miller, we're gonna stick with you on this next one. We have um, a question from Nancy. Um, you stated the outbreak in the fall came from off-campus students and activities. Why are your policies aimed at regulating testing and enforcing safe practices, practices toward the campus to on-campus students only? Why are on-campus students being restricted and punished? Um, why are off-campus students not required to be tested before next semester? Um, shouldn't Dining Hall, UREC, Jack Card, and other campus resources all be restricted for every student until tested? Sure, well, thanks, Nancy, for the question. I appreciate it. Uh, or I guess questions, there's a lot in there. Uh, so a couple of different things I would say. One, um, the quarantine housing is for on-campus students. That's what we've set that aside for, and that's for a couple of reasons. One, uh, the close quarter or close you know, living arrangements of a residence hall, that's different than a four-person apartment. Uh, students that live off campus, those students actually are considered a family unit, so they would actually live together. However, 
if one student on a floor of 20 students, they could impact all 20 of those students. So there's much bigger impact that can happen in, in spread of the virus in an on-campus setting than there is off-campus. We also then have some limitations as, as far as how much quarantine and isolation housing we have. That's not the case off-campus. That whole apartment complex, that apartment group, that four-person group, let's use that as an example, would all actually just quarantine in place if someone in their house was actually, you know, proved to be positive. So the impact is very, very different. Uh, we also give different support to our on-campus students. They've chosen to live on campus with us. We have a different level of responsibility to them. So because of that, we have to provide different things, including the meals, housing, and all that. Uh, and again, we are still asking our off-campus students to quarantine for eight days. So before they come back to help with that. I'd also note that all of us are taking, you know, having some sacrifices that we're doing, we're doing because of the pandemic. So, and please note that when you talk about the dining hall, you rack, those types of things, that's not where the virus spread. So I don't feel that I need to limit their access to that because that's not where the spread was happening. It was happening in social events, both on and off campus. Uh, but it was social events where students weren't wearing masks and were engaging in activities that spread the virus. So that that's the reason why we've taken the approach that we have. And it's, it's in line with our other colleagues across the Commonwealth as well. Great. Um, let's talk about vaccines for a moment. Uh, a common question ha has become, what are the chances that students will be able to be vaccinated before the end of spring semester? Uh, can we start with you, Dr. Miller, and then go with you, Provost uh, Coltman? Sure. This is the, I would call it the million dollar question. I think everyone wants to know when they can get the vaccine. And I appreciate that. And I'm excited uh, that people want to get it. And I think that's going to be an important choice for people to make. Um, we don't control this. Uh, Virginia Department of Health is in charge of regulating and distributing the vaccines. I'll note that we have a great relationship with them. We actually hosted a clinic today in the Convocation Center and plan to do that for the rest of the semester. So we are going to be a hub for vaccines here, uh, but Virginia Department of Health will still control them. We're just the host, but it says something about our relationship with them that they've chosen us to be where they're gonna host these events. Uh, I saw a lot of our health center staff and our counseling center staff all getting uh, vaccines today. So by being testing partners, uh, being good partners with them, we're going to be able to get a lot of these vaccines out. Uh, college students or the faculty and staff here are in the 1C area. So there's 1A, 1B, and 1C. If you haven't seen that, uh, you you should go out and, and look at VDH's website. That's where you can see updates. That's also where you can you can go on and there's actually a form you can fill out to say that you want to get it and it'll give you a sense of when you're going to get your vaccine. Uh, we won't control when you get it, uh, but we are going to do everything we can to be good partners to make sure that as soon as you can get it, we're ready to support that. Uh, we'll be doing thousands of vaccines and I'm sorry, I always get the vaccine and testing language mixed up in my head, but we're doing thousands of vaccines a week here on campus in support of VDH. So my hope is that we will get students the vaccine and be able to be a part of that. Uh, the timing of that, I, again, I, I realize that I can't answer the, the most important part of this question. Uh, my hope is yes, uh, but there's a lot between now and the end of the semester that has to happen. We've got to get through 1A, 1B, 1C before you can get to college age students and really people under 65. Well, and I'll tag team on that too. Once you've had the vaccine, you've got to wait whatever it is, two or three weeks before you get your second vaccine. And then you still have to wait two weeks before you are fully in the clear. So um, I think it's going to be important for everyone to remember that once you have the vaccine, we've still got to practice very um, vigilant preventative care, especially in academic spaces, classrooms, and all the places where people gather. Right. I think it's really important, Heather. And then, sorry, Rudy, we'll, we'll let you go back to other questions. I think this is not, you know, says you're not going to get anything and you're not, it's going to be perfect. You know, just like the flu vaccine, which I got already this year, and I hope you all have gotten your flu shots as well. Uh, it doesn't mean you're never going to get the flu during the season. Uh, it might be less. It might be a better experience. You might not get that strain. Uh, this is not a perfect, you know, this is not a perfect shield, so to speak, of everything. So we have to continue this whole semester. We will be expecting everyone to continue to live in a way that's safe and protects themselves and others. Wonderful. Um, we have a question for Virginia that's coming in. Um, and I'm going to open this up to either of you who would like to respond first. Has JMU considered another plan if the next administration, referring to the, to, um, the new uh, federal administration coming in, has another view of how the virus is to be handled? Um, this is definitely a possibility. 
does JMU have a plan for Virginia? Heather, I'll jump in, and Heather, if you want to add something. Yeah, I, I think, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, Virginia, thanks so much for the question. I, I think the hypotheticals are challenging. I think we are um, we are constantly paying attention and seeing what's there. I'm paying attention to uh, the um, the different events for the transition to see what they're talking about. I'm, I appreciate that the biggest thing that I've heard being talked about is an increase in the number of you know, vaccines that we have and, and trying to do everything we can to get everyone vaccinated as quickly as we can. So we're ready to do that and we're eager to do that. So I think that that absolutely is a goal to be able to be that. And I think, again, as I mentioned before, being a good partner with VDH to make sure that that happens. Uh, it is hard for us to plan for what we don't know yet, uh, but we are absolutely focused on being ready to do as much as we can to keep the community safe. Yeah, and I'd add to that, we live and breathe COVID contingency planning, right? So we are meeting really daily um, with all sorts of groups of people, both on campus and off campus with VDH and local health officials. And so we are doing everything we can to stay up to speed with the latest changes in whatever is happening with the progression of the virus or policy. So, you know, we will absolutely be um, consulting with the best expertise that we can find as the situation evolves. I have a question from Lisa here, and um, she's asking a question about CARE Act, and um, here it is. Will there be any additional funds available through the CARE Act to assist students in financial need for this spring semester? I don't know the answer to that. Do you? Uh, I mean, the, the problem, Lisa, with this is everyone, there's different qualifications for CARES Act funds, so I'm definitely not an expert in that space to be able to Say that also depends on what other bills. I know that there was, uh, I read a piece this morning in the New York Times about um, President-elect Biden looking to have another $2,000 uh, $2, uh, piece for each American that qualifies. So potentially, uh, I don't believe that we have additional CARES Act money that has been given to us. I haven't seen enough about the, the new bill that went through Congress to know what that might look like for the university yet. So. I haven't, I don't know enough about how that looks, so I apologize we don't have a great answer for you yet, but I also wonder if there will be another another um, bill that gets passed uh, in the Biden administration to potentially support that as well. And, and we've got lots of government relations staff and advocates who are out there trying to, again, stay on top of the news and, and advocate very strongly for our needs. I think for the purposes of that question, because uh, we, it sounds like a question that is gonna continue to evolve uh, because our responses are also going to be posted online um, through a web um, URL location. Uh, if and when we do have that update information or anything regarding this uh, question, we can always add to that website. Absolutely. So thanks for um, for uh, attempting to and um, addressing that. Let's uh, switch back to um, academics for a moment. And um, there's a topic on, on classrooms, Provost Coltman. Um, we have a few more questions about classes. Uh, Janine asks, uh, will professors be required to hold live class sessions via virtually? Mm. So this goes back to students having options, right? So when the academic unit scheduled their spring courses, um, the schedule indicated whether the course would be taught in person, online synchronously, which means, of course, in real time, or asynchronously, which means there's recorded lectures and activities. Um, so this information was indicated on the spring course registration so students could select the class that was the best one for them. Um, and as you know, some courses are designed to be delivered entirely in person or in online or hybrid. So there were those options were definitely out there for students to review. Um, and we know from talking to students that it was important to them to know which class modality was, was going to be available to them so that they could adequately prepare and make the best selection. Um, obviously, students don't want to plan for an in-person class and then have it move online. And guess what? Faculty don't either. So your professors feel exactly the same way. They plan their classes very carefully, and the mode of delivery is a really big part of that. So a class that has that is in-person has elements that just are not going to be effective if it's delivered virtually, if it hasn't been planned that way. So, you know, we are deferring to the faculty to determine the best way to deliver the material and the students will be in, in uh, close contact with the faculty to talk through um, whatever the questions might be that come up through the course of the semester. And Rudy and Heather, can I just interrupt real quick? 
Um, I thought I recognized something from earlier today. We did act, uh, some guidance around the care, the last CARES Act did actually just, just like right before this meeting came out. So there is some more information. I don't know enough about it to share, but please know that the right people on financial aid have it. So we do know a little bit more than I knew two minutes ago because I just, I thought I had seen that email. Uh, so we did get a little more guidance today. So more will be coming. But yeah. I saw that email too, but I didn't want to guess what was in it. So yes, we will certainly share once we know. Yeah, I can give you a brief update. We have um, some colleagues who are, are listening in and our, our financial aid experts um, let us know that there is no more CARES Act money. That money is gone. However, uh, there will be more COVID relief money coming. Once we have all of the information about this, we'll make this available to students and families online. So thank you, financial aid experts and, and colleagues on campus for, for chiming in in real time. Um, let's see here. Uh, let's, uh, Phyllis Coleman, you were talking about courses. Let's um, stay on that with um, and talk about instructors now. That um, we have a, a question. Um, why aren't professors required to up their game, quote unquote, during these virtual times as opposed to just reading PowerPoints? Many have resorted to not teaching and not being available, or perhaps using pre-recorded lectures with just voice over PowerPoints. So, you know, if there's one thing I know about JMU faculty, they're utterly committed to teaching and to, to learning. Our faculty and our professors are excellent teachers. Um, they want to uh, help all students succeed. I have been extremely impressed with how our faculty have responded to all these changes that have taken place during the pandemic. Um, and, you know, for a little context, JMU has been offering online education for a very long time. Our, we have an online master's program in info security that's been around for almost 25 years. Um, but, of course, many of our instructors did have to adapt to new technology and new delivery methods. And they did this. Um, there were almost 350 faculty that went through an online institute that was offered. And our libraries offered over 150 workshops for the faculty, and these were attended by faculty, I think my numbers show about 1,500 times. So, you know, over 75% of our instructors have sought out the training um, so that they can really offer the very best of online approaches in the past year, and they're continuing to seek ways to better their delivery methods. So, you know, instructional approaches are very diverse. Um, they're gonna be diverse in your face-to-face -face courses. They're gonna be diverse in your online courses. Some professors use both asynchronous and synchronous approaches so that students have that flexibility to access course material and participate in, in the course in different ways. Um, professors try to balance the content delivery with different strategies that give opportunities to students to apply in different ways. And of course, that might evolve over the course of the semester as the professor sees how the students are doing. So everyone is continuing to adopt new strategies and to adapt their strategies that maximize their student engagement. I would say though, if, if a student is, is struggling to understand what the professor is doing and is not feeling satisfied and not feeling that they can progress well, the best thing to do is reach out to the instructor, ask for a conversation. Our professors are best able to explain their approach. And you know it's really important to reach out to the faculty and talk to them directly about whatever concerns might be going on. Wonderful. Okay, um, Heather, we're going to stay with you just for a moment. Um, why are the classes, why are the classes that are so small, um, even, uh, forgive me here, why are the classes so small, even when they are staying virtual, it has been impossible to get classes needed for majors? Mm. So, you know, even pre-COVID class size is uh, something that varies according to the subject of the course, the level of the course, the type of course, the type of delivery, um, you know, where it is in a student's curriculum, who's in the course. So we do this um, very carefully to balance the course quality and student access to the courses. So, you know, for this particular student who, who, who wrote this question, if you're having challenges getting into the courses you need, the very best thing you can do is to reach out to your academic advisor or the academic unit head um, of that program and get their assistance because everyone is very eager to make uh, courses accessible and available um, in the very best way we can. So, you know, I can't answer that specific question, but definitely reach out to the advisors. All right. Um, we have another question from a parent. 
Um, as a parent, I've had reports that faculty are not responding to questions and requests for support with content. Um, how is the university ensuring that faculty are available outside of class to help? My student was in a situation of uh, teaching himself hard content. Um, how about required mid-semester evaluations of instructors and interventions from, from administration if an instructor is not meeting these student needs? Mm -hmm. So faculty are required to hold office hours. Um, this is just part of their ex job expectation. Um, these office hours are sort of mandated and they're scheduled outside of the class meeting time. So often the student might have a conflict and not be able to attend the scheduled office hours. Again, please, as students, reach out directly to the professor and request a meeting. Um, you do have the opportunity to meet with your faculty outside of class. Um, you know, in, in my experience, the vast majority of our faculty are more than willing to work with students. They're flexible, they're available. Uh, the faculty I know work well into the evening and often on weekends trying to uh, meet with students virtually or in person, whatever works best. If you do have trouble reaching your faculty member um, and you are having issues with communication, please feel free to contact that the program's academic unit head. Um, and you should do that. Uh, it's important to know um, if a professor is not responding for some reason. And if for whatever reason the academic unit head is, is not able to help you resolve that, please reach out to Rudy Molina because he, this is his, uh, one of the important things that, that his role is um, providing to the university is ensuring student academic success and progress. Um, and then you, you asked about the mid-semester evaluations of faculty. Some instructors do administer um, mid-semester, mid-term evaluations to learn about how students are responding um, and to, to find out what questions students might have. This lets them adjust the class, perhaps adapt the timing of how they're presenting material um, and how students are experiencing it. And also in some academic units, uh, other faculty or even the unit head will conduct um, observations of the faculty and, and of their colleagues so that they can provide feedback to them. So this is one of the ways that we make sure that our faculty are receiving feedback and able to kind of demonstrate how they're learning and adapting. Um, you know, it, it might be possible for us to institute a mid-semester evaluation across the university, but that's, you know, 1,500 faculty. Um, and if we did that, um, that's, a, that's a big project. It would be difficult to get the results tabulated and return to the faculty member um, within a time frame where they could make some adjustments um, for their courses. But certainly um, there's feedback at the end of the semester and we use that feedback. Um, every faculty member uses that feedback from students to improve or enhance or adapt their teaching. So again, I, I think with, with all these questions, one of the most important things a student needs to do is become a self-advocate. If you have a concern about your faculty member, please, please reach out to them and talk to them directly. And if that's uncomfortable or if it doesn't work, please feel free to reach out to the academic team. All right, great. Um, Emily, I want to first thank you for your question that's coming up next. Um, if we are not able to go back to fully in-person classes by February 1st, well, there will be a certain set of classes like labs, for instance, that will be able to be in person. And um, Tim or Heather, uh, uh, we can start with you maybe, Heather, and then and go from there. I am so sorry. Would you please repeat the question? Sure. If, there are, if we are not able to go back into fully in-person classes mm -hmm. by February 1st, will there be certain classes like labs, for example, that will be able to be in person? Yes, um, we have been making some of those exceptions when we can guarantee um, the physical distancing and the mask wearing and all the safety protocols because there are specific curricular that can only be delivered in person. Um, my discipline's music, right? It's very difficult to make music when you're not in person. So I understand, but with labs as well. So we have made some of those exceptions as we've gone along and we would consider those exceptions again, as long as we can ensure the safety protocols. Great. Um, Alexis has a question for us uh, coming in. Has there been any decisions regarding graduation? Will it be in person or virtual? You know, we're in the middle of discussing that right now. In fact, I know that Vice President Harper had a meeting with her team just, uh, I think, today to look at some of the options. So we are in the middle of discussing that and looking at, at what would be the best thing at this time. And, you know, this one of the things that makes us so difficult is everything's evolving all the time. And so um, we will definitely let folks know as soon as we're able to make a decision. 
And I would just add in, because I actually had a conversation today about this. One of the things that's hard is that I know that everyone wants an answer to this as soon as possible. And the challenge is, if you had the answer today, you have to go with what today looks like, which is a governor's order that limits the number of people that can be together. And you'd have to say, well, no, then it's not going to happen. And I don't want to make that decision today because I, I am, and I know the provost is, we're committed to trying to do something to allow students to have that celebration and to have that with their families. And I appreciate that knowing right now what May is going to look like would be great. And I would love that in my life too. And I'm totally with you and wanting that. But making that decision today would be based on today's information. And today's information tells us we would have to say, no, there's not a graduation in May. And I'm not willing to settle for that. That feels like a give up to me. And I think that, and I would say in talking to President Alger today about it, he feels the same way that we can't sort of give up on that. We've got to see if we can do this. Our students from class of 2020 deserve their moment and our students from the class of 2021 deserve their moment. And we need to wait and see if we can make that best situation occur for them. And that's what, for me, what guides, I think, everything that I'm bringing to these discussions is how do we continue to make the best decisions to give our students the best experience possible? And I want to I wanna wait. I personally believe we need to wait until we can make a decision that hopefully gives our students what they deserve, which is a moment. Uh, you deserve the moment to walk across the stage and be celebrated for that. And we can't make the best decision right now. And what a lesson in learning to be flexible and adaptable. Wow. Great. Um, let's see, Tim, uh, were there uh, comments or, or questions that, that you would like to address or any things you'd like to fill in with regards to quarantine? Sure. I, I think we always get questions about what that will look like. A uh, couple different things to think about, you know, and it's, it's similar to the testing that we talked about for entry testing. We still recommend that if students uh, need to quarantine or isolate, that they go home. And I'll explain why that is, because people always say, why are you sending people home? Well, one, the vast majority of our students who had to quarantine never actually got it. Uh, it's, a, it's a good thing to do. It's the right thing to do to protect the community by if you're you being a close contact, uh, being quarantined. But it's also not a fun experience. You're, you're, in a, you know, you're in a room for 14 days alone. So one good thing is the CDC has shifted that. Uh, so that now uh, most, many people will be able to get out in 10 days, but that will require every situation will be different. So I need everyone to not just say, I'm out in 10 days, that's great. Um, but it's still 10 days. Uh, so you'll work with the health center and we'll be able to decide that with each, each student to figure out what that's like for them. Uh, we'll continue to provide meals. If our numbers get where, where they were, we would actually do meals like we did before, where students would go to two separate locations outside of the room to get their meals and then return. Um, they get all sorts of information. We also provide liaisons, which to be honest, have not been used very much yet by students, but we have a liaison program where a student has someone that they can reach out to if they have questions. One of the things that was interesting in the fall is we would call a student who was in quarantine or isolation and ask them how they were doing, but they never answered the phone. And then I'd get a phone call from a student or a parent saying, no one's been looking out for my student or a student saying, no one cares about me. Like they do, you just keep ignoring the phone call. So by assigning them a liaison, you know who's going to be calling you. So you'll actually hopefully pick up when they call. You can also say, I don't want, I don't need it, I'm good. Um, but going home is a valuable thing. Think of it this way. If you've got to be alone for 10 days in a space, you probably would rather that be in your home where your family can be there for you, with you, especially for quarantine, where you may not, a very low chance so far that you would actually have it. So we want you to have that support and that's a better situation for you. Uh, we also will reach out through Counseling Center. We have a 24 hour counseling line that students can use, all students can use, not just those in quarantine and isolation. Uh, the value actually, the isolation tends to be a little less problematic for most students because despite what it's called, you're actually with other people. So you're actually in a space with other people who've tested positive because you can't give it to each other because you have it. So it's still again, not ideal. A lot of people that had that tested positive last year actually did go home and preferred that experience just like quarantine. Uh, so there are a lot of the different resources that we provide um, through the food, through the outreach, through the liaisons and all that. Uh, that will remain the same. We also uh, increased our number of quarantine isolation beds in the fall uh, at, in October and we've done that again this year or this spring. So we will have a larger number as well for that. We also, the last thing I'll say, Rudy, sorry, 
uh, is we have a large number of rooms on campus that are actually quarantine in place rooms. So if you're not using a common bath on the hallway, uh, if you have a smaller number, almost like you're an apartment, like we talked about off campus, that you're a small family unit, you would actually quarantine in place. So a large number of our, um, over a thousand of our beds on campus are actually, would be quarantined in place if someone was quarantined. Isolation would always get removed. Uh, and we'd always want to remove them from that space and put them somewhere else. Okay, great. Um, let's see here, moving right along. Uh, we have several questions that have mentioned that students are missing uh, out on opportunities to connect with either themselves, other students, or faculty uh, within their related to their coursework. Now, what suggestions might you have for them? Uh, Heather, if we can start with you, and, and then uh, Tim, if you can address that as well. Oh boy, that really hits hits home because I desperately miss interacting with my colleagues, and I really miss seeing all of the students. So. You know, we, we are all missing you as, as, as much as you may be missing us. Um, you know, many of the students continue to engage with faculty um, online and virtual meetings. I know that's less satisfying. It's not quite as heartwarming, but we've got academic advisors ready to meet with you. We've got folks in the learning centers. We've got teaching assistants. You know, folks are all ready to set up um, online office hours, virtual meetings. So do take advantage of that. And don't forget too, you know, there are virtual tutoring resources in the learning centers. You can have a one-on-one -on -one session with faculty from the communication center or with other students through the peer assisted study sessions program pass. So there are a lot of ways to do things. And yes, it's not quite the same as being in person, but I assure you that everyone on campus, all of our employees miss the students as much as you miss us. So we would love to connect as much as, as we can with I agree. I think uh, a couple of different things I would share. Um, we we want you to connect. We want you to find that community. We're offering many things in person that are safe to do so. Uh, I just, I'm obsessed with this, so I'll just keep saying it. I'm really impressed that University Program Board and Student Activities continues to offer movies in Grafton. It is for a small group of people, um, but I watched It's a Wonderful Life before uh, the winter break, my first time ever watching it. Uh, didn't love it. You can be mad at me about that later, but um, you know, it was great to watch a movie on a big screen. It's actually the only movie theater in Harrisonburg right now is on our campus, uh, sadly, because other ones have closed. So there's those things. And, and one of the things that's interesting to me, um, a new term came to me over winter break called FOBO, fear of better options. Uh, and it feels like a lot of people are waiting to see what's a better thing to do. And then the end, a lot of times they end up doing nothing. And what I want to challenge our students to do is get out. You're allowed to be outside your room. You know, I'm not saying gather in groups of 500 people, but I'm saying you can leave your room, go to the resident, you know, go to the dining halls, you know, eat, eat there. I think that the reality is when I, I've had a lot of students that I've talked to and they said, well, I'm not meeting people. And I asked them what they're doing to meet people. And they've said, well, I've been in my room. That's the, the best way to not meet people is to stay in your room. And I understand that people are scared, um, but we do need to get out a little bit. And one thing going off what um, Provost Coleman said, too, is in your classes, when you've got the classes and you're on Zoom and you're think, seeing that, who's in your classes? You know, I, I found from talking to students that they usually meet people through the residence hall and through classes, and that's how they build some of those connections. Notice a person's name, look them up, you know, on Snap or on Facebook or, or in, uh, Instagram or whatever, look them up and reach out to them and say, hey, I think we're in the same class together. Just take that, take that um, sort of risk there. Remember that for many of you, you haven't made friends in 12 years because you've been in the same school system. So you have to go put yourself out there a little bit. Uh, some things that we're doing to help you, uh, MLK, the celebration of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, is next week. There are a number of events on there. You'll be able to participate in those and engage with and learn from other people and, and see other people. Weeks of Welcome has a, lots of events that you can participate, including our student org night. That's another way to go out and meet people. Remember that you were here for a short period of time, then some of you went home and stayed home. Some of you came back. You've not yet been through that beginning to have that much time. You do have that again. You have that chance again. It's almost you know, the second chance to do this. Uh, I'll also note just, I have a student advisory board uh, that has students on it. Please feel free to email me directly, millertm at jmu.edu. We'd love to have you join us. Uh, just a fun thing that I'm doing that I've really enjoyed. Music is important to me. I know it's very important to the provost as well. Um, I am nowhere near at the level of talent as the provost, but uh, I can play some old school, you know, guitar songs. So we're doing commons concerts and festival concerts where 
myself and whoever wants to come up can sing a song. We're wearing masks. We're far apart. Uh, we'll be doing those in the festival uh, once a week until it gets warm enough to come back to the commons. If you like music, look out for that. Come do, come do those. And we're also going to be hosting a lot of other different things. We're hoping to do some things with our acapella groups and our dance groups where you can engage with those. But I also, I will just reiterate one more time, Student Org Night is a great way for you to see what's out there and connect with those student orgs. Uh, but I just think you got to get out of your room, got to try to interact with other people. I think this will be different with over 5,000 people coming back to the residence halls. You will get a chance to meet the people within your halls that maybe you didn't meet in the fall. Well, those are wonderful recommendations, suggestions. Um, uh, th this actually concludes the first part of, um, of the town hall where we had some questions. We did a little mix of some questions that we had prepared ourselves based on the questions that had been submitted, as well as some live stream questions that were coming in. Uh, thank you to all the students who were, were submitting with, uh, along, along the way with us. We um, want to take some more questions. We do have a few more minutes before the hour's up. I see Xavier has posted a question that I'd like to put out there to the provost and, and Vice President um, Miller. Uh, could you please discuss ways students can report situations that go against the university's COVID guidelines, for example, social gathering, et cetera, and how the university will handle those reports? Yeah, thanks, Xavier. I appreciate it. Um, the Live Safe app is still the best way to report those. That is being uh, watched constantly by the university police department. So they are responding to the things that are actionable in the moment. Um, I, I want you all to know, I understand that it's frustrating uh, if you're a student who's doing everything right and then you walk by a big party or something like that. Um, we are doing the best we can to, um, to address those behaviors. I get that it's frustrating for you, it's frustrating for me. Uh, I think the reality is, I, I wish that we didn't have to do that. I said this in the fall, uh, after I did my ride along on Halloween, like that's not why I got into this was to run around and try and stop students from doing what, what some might call a normal college thing, but it's just not a normal college year. So I would ask that you continue to use Live Safe. Uh, you can also call the police department, but the Live Safe is actually a better way to do it because we can document it. So I'd recommend that you do that. And then we do address it. The, uh, we address over 550 incidents in the fall. Uh, and I'm really proud of the staff that did that. Um, they worked harder than, than they would have imagined, I think, uh, doing that, but they did great work and, and still focused on learning. Uh, but we also had some students that hosted some pretty large events that did face some pretty severe consequences, including suspension. Um, so it's important that people make good choices, but those that choose not to, I understand the need and I appreciate folks that want to let us know about that and we will address it. You may not know how we address it, but we do follow through and address it. Great. Um, as maybe one or two other questions come in live and we'll wait, we'll give a, a few moments for those to come in. Uh, I wanted to uh, take a moment to thank a few folks. Um, first and foremost, um, Dr. Tim Miller and Dr. Heather Coltman for, for really putting on a, a great panel here and a great show of, of this information, uh, insight, recommendations, suggestions, and, and your overall kind of oversight and leadership um, here at GMU. Uh, I also want to give a shout out to all the folks behind the scenes that make an event like this um, a successful creative media here at GMU as well as many others. Uh, a special shout out also to some of those audience members who chimed in and gave some insight and responses, uh, especially to the financial aid colleagues. Um, and of course, our students um, who are actively engaging in this conversation, um, but many others along the way. Um, I'd like to uh, personally thank uh, Nick and Della from uh, SGA and, and all your colleagues um, and for, for guiding us and, and giving us insight on the processes and questions that you have along the way. So um, I think we're coming to an end, although we might have one or two coming in. Um, let me see. Let me just check the queue real quick. Um, here is something different. Uh, what Jamie thinks... Uh, what genuine thing, things do you miss the most right now? What are you going to do first when we're back in person? So we're going to light, we're going to end on a light note, it seems oh, that's like. A, that's um, a great set of yeah. questions. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to go to the Forbes Center. I cannot wait to get back to watching our students show us what they've done, whether it's music or dance or theater 
or in the uh, visual arts, I so love um, watching the sort of culminating experiences of what our art students do. And it's not just the art students. I mean, we have so many symposia and conferences where students have the chance to present what their work is. And I miss that so much. So I'm really looking forward to seeing the results of all the students' hard work. Uh, I'm, I, I would say a couple of different things. I, I agree, the student events. I, I believe that not only do I believe I actually have the best job on campus, no offense, Heather. No. Else. I, um, I, I also know I have the best view on campus. I get a little bit higher up than Heather. I miss seeing the quad full. Uh, I miss seeing students there uh, enjoying their time, being sort of free to enjoy their college experience. Uh, I miss football. I miss sports. Uh, you know, it's, it's, I'll just be that guy. I love, I love watching our teams. I love what, honestly, it's funny to me as the guy in my job, I feel like I spend more time watching everyone in the stands, enjoying the experience than I do sometimes the football games, mostly because lately we just kill everybody. Uh, but I think it's just fun to watch the experience, watch the MRDs at halftime, watch the MRDs at the end. Uh, I just think seeing those moments when our community really comes together to celebrate each other and celebrate life together uh, I miss graduation. Uh, I think that um, I have a really a big emotional connection to graduation here, having graduated from here twice myself. Uh, I miss going to those events. Um, I just I miss sort of watching our students and the celebration of those things. I think that uh, I might want graduation to happen more than all of the seniors, to be honest. Uh, I just think those seeing this community come together in those ways is just really amazing. And then the last thing I'll say is the little moments where I see people meeting each other and connecting and uh, going to the dining hall and seeing those small gatherings of students together in a different way. Uh, so just the freedom to connect, the freedom to build community, I think is really, really good. Um, and, and I miss that. Um, so yeah. Well, and it also occurs to me that um, much of what you guys are reminiscing about, I have never experienced here at JMU as I am a, a newer team member I look forward to the football games. I look forward to a full and vibrant quad. Um, I look forward to, to many of the things that um, that make this uh, make this space a very special place. Um, we do have a question from Sierra. I'd love to be able to see. Hey, can I just maybe. interrupt really quickly yeah. before you change the topic? Right now, it feels like this is forever, but it's not. There's going to be a time when we look back on this and wow, that was a weird year. Right. So there is definitely light at the end of the tunnel and we're almost out of it. I'm sorry. I just had to put that little hope out there. No, I agree with you, Heather. I think it's important that we remember, you know, now having lived a few more years now in my life that I, I can sort of look back and say, man, I remember the moment that thing, you know, back in my 20s was, oh, my God, this is terrible. It's never going to end. And right. this is hard and it's absolutely a challenge. And, you know, I think that we, you know, we've all been through a lot, but I also think it's a thing that will only shape us as much as we let it. And I think the many lessons learned of it will be what we remember and what sticks with us forever. That's uh, right. So I agree. There, There is, I feel more than ever that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and I'm excited about where we go from here. And um, yeah. Well, if I can be a little selfish here, I'd love to, we do have just a couple more minutes. I'd love to ask both of you a question. Um, and, and, and it's in the same spirit as we were just talking about reflecting and and your leadership on campus. Um, what is the biggest lesson that you've learned in your role here at JMU? Heather, I can go if you want me to. You know, I I would say hope and perseverance. Rudy, I think that there, there have been times in this where I'm like, oh my gosh, when is this gonna, like, when is there gonna be good news? Uh, and there's good news every day. It's just harder and harder to find, I think. And I'm not trying to be Pollyanna about it. I just think we've got to persevere. And I remember um, I'm actually writing uh, two different uh, recommendations for colleagues who are going to doctoral programs. And one of the things that I, one of the biggest things I think about in getting a doctorate is not about intelligence and all that. It's about perseverance. And I think that we, we as this community, can persevere through this. Uh, I came back to this place because I believe in JMU. Uh, and I think that we can be bold and we can persevere and we, we will be better on the other side of this. Uh, and I just believe that. So for me, I think a lesson learned is that one of the most important things all of us bring into our world and our lives is perseverance. I totally agree with that. Innovation, innovation, innovation. Turn on a dime, change your mind, be able to adapt. Um, but I would add one other piece of that. 
even though we may not be able to get to be in person with those people that we really care for and who are close to us, we can still enrich and deepen um, our relationships, even virtually. So, I mean, I think holding people dear who are really important to us um, is even more important now. And it doesn't mean that we can't still develop very close and wonderful, meaningful relationships, even in a virtual space. All right, great. Well, thank you for your time this evening uh, to both of you and all the students and those who are watching in our community. Um, we're signing off for tonight, but um, we'll see each other soon online or in person sometime very, very soon, hopefully. Everyone, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Go Dukes.